today. I mean, obviously, this is uh, a different format for the public board meeting. Um, but I think it's the exactly the right format for the circumstances. And Mark, I particularly wanted to thank you and your team for uh, uh, putting us in a position where we can have uh, such a good meeting um, uh, remotely. I think it's a it's a great um, uh, great benefit to us. Um, there are two really big topics on the the agenda for today. Uh, obviously, uh, COVID nineteen and our, our response to it is, is something we will need to talk about at some length. Uh, and then secondly, uh, uh, <clears throat> Professor Murphy's report um, uh, will be very important as well. Um, uh, we'll devote plenty of time to those two items. Uh, there is obviously also some normal business to deal with, um, and, and we, will, we will deal with that uh, as we go through. So that's sort of by way of introduction. Um, the only apology uh, that we have today is from Paul Rue, uh, and we are joined uh, today uh, by Holly Sutherland uh, uh, from our Race Equality Network. You're very welcome, Holly, at this meeting. Uh, are there any declarations of interest that anybody uh, needs to raise? Very good. And then uh, minutes of uh, our last meeting, 26th of February, are there a true and accurate record of everything we discussed? Yeah. I'll yeah. take that as agreement. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there are only um, uh, two items on the action log. They're both on the agenda today. Um, is there anything arising that anybody wanted to raise that isn't on the agenda? Excellent. Good. Let's let's um, in that case move move on. Um, uh, Professor Murphy, are, are you are you with us at the moment? Yes, I am. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Can I can I uh, thank you for joining us this way? Can I thank you very much for uh, the the really excellent report? I thought anyway, and, and for all the work you've been doing uh, on our behalf. Um, Perhaps I could just hand straight over to you um, to say whatever you want to say by way of introduction uh, to the report and the recommendations, which I think are, uh, are, are really helpful and valuable. And then we'll open it up for a discussion if we may. Uh, so over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for asking me to do this report. Um, I'll start, if I may, with a very brief introduction about myself, since people may not know me, uh, and then take you through the report and the recommendations. Um, I'm uh, a clinical psychologist by training, and I've worked at the Institute of Psychiatry and uh, various universities, and I'm now at Tizard Centre, University of Kent. And all my working life has been spent with people with learning disabilities and or autism, and challenging behaviour has been a particular interest of mine. Um, I've um, worked in universities doing research and teaching, but also consultancy. And almost all of my posts were half time in the NHS. So I've worked in a whole series of different kinds of settings, both for children and adults in the community, in forensic services, in secure services. So this is a topic very close to my heart. Um, and um, just to, before we start to say a little bit about the terms of reference, um, what I was asked to do was to look at the regulation of Walton Hall by CQC between 2015 and 2019, and to consider whether they could have detected the abuse earlier, um, and then to make some recommendations for uh, how they should proceed. Um, my process was to look at the very extensive amount of CQC information um, on your various systems and then to conduct interviews both with inspectors and um, other members of staff in CQC and people outside CQC, such as uh, CCG uh, representatives and um, Durham local safeguarding representatives and... Um, uh, a number of other people. What I should say in terms of limitations is that 
I probably haven't read everything. I feel like I've read everything, but I probably haven't. Um, there are some people I couldn't interview. There was a police investigation ongoing during the whole of the time of my report. And so, of course, I haven't been able to interview service users and carers who were witnesses in that uh, investigation, although I did speak briefly to the police. Um, and lastly, I wasn't able to interview um, people who worked in the current provider, Signet, uh, well, the, the provider who, who was the current provider when Walton Hall was open. Um, Signet was concerned about the terms of reference and um, the uh, context of the criminal investigations, and so interviews with Signet staff did not proceed. But I did manage to find five uh, ex-Danchel staff uh, who I did interview, and Danchel, as you know, was the uh, provider of Walton Hall services for most of the period 2015 to 2019. Now, just to move on to the report, um, I have given quite a lot of background um, because I'm aware that many of the people who read this report won't be aware of the background. And there were a lot of uh, relevant events going on over the previous few years, including, of course, Winterbourne View. Um, which on reflection, um, uh, you know, is is remarkably similar to what happened at Walton Hall. Um, that led to transforming care, um, which was ongoing for much of the period. There were a whole lot of um, programmes on TV and radio about people being um, uh, receiving abusive care in various settings. There was a CQC segregation and restraint review and there was the Joint Committee on Human Rights. So there was a lot going on in learning disabilities and autism, um, all of it saying basically that um, these kinds of settings are high risk settings and can be abusive. Now, um, after the background, I talk about the CQC methods and I know that'll be familiar to all of you, but I'm aware that people who read this report won't know about the CQC's normal methods. And uh, CQC has been heavily criticised uh, in relation to Walton Hall, I think sometimes by people who don't know how you work and don't know how thorough and careful and thought out your processes are. So I've said a bit about your methods. Um, I then go on to the inspections and then to the interviews um, and finally to analysis and recommendations. And um, I think probably be most helpful if I move straight to the analysis and then the recommendations. Um, the things that were striking, um, having uh, conducted all the interviews and looked at the paperwork, were that um, in, th there were seven inspections in all of uh, Walton Hall. The last one, the seventh one, I will discount because it happened after um, the Panorama programme had not hadn't been aired but was uh, it, CQC was aware of its contents so that was very much post hoc so just thinking about the first six two of them uh, were comprehensive inspections and they both rated um, C, uh, Walton Hall as good the others were unannounced inspections often responsive to um, complaints or allegations and uh, they rated uh, Walton Hall as requires improvement. Um, and I think one of the things that is, is clear is that in, the, in those kinds of settings, it is possible to make it look good, especially if you know you're going to be inspected and um, you've got maybe senior staff in the provider who can come and help make sure that you've got all your care plans in place and all your records straight and so on. But it's clear that unannounced visits are much more revealing. That said, um, Walton Hall had 37 visitors in nine months, um, according to the CCG rep that I interviewed. Um, and so across the five year period, it must have had a lot more than that. Uh, and these were visitors like CCGs, uh, learning disability partnership boards, um, local authority safeguarding, police, all sorts of people, and none of them recognised abuse going on. 
Um, and several of them said that because Milton Hall was re was reporting uh, allegations of abuse, they thought it was probably being transparent. Um, now, another thing that's very striking in the inspection reports is that in every single one, uh, service users and carers are said to be um, happy with the service. So service users say that staff are caring, that they're kind to them, that they respect them, etc. Um, and from what we saw on Panorama, of course, that's extraordinarily surprising. But I think there were reasons for that in that service users were interviewed in the presence of staff um, and uh, very few carers were interviewed and those carers were selected by um, the staff. Staff themselves, the more junior staff in Morton Hall, were interviewed by uh, inspectors, but again, not on their own. So there's clearly an issue about interviewing in private. Then the third thing that's striking is that there were a lot of abuse allegations and they were um, escalating. So the, the table that the um, safeguarding representative uh, gave me made it clear that there were a large number of escalations. They were escalating. And also that um, Dan Shaw, the provider for most of that time, did know about um, the so-called toxic culture. So mo moving on to recommendations, my first one is about data. All of the CQC inspectors, who I have to say were an impressive bunch, they were very thoughtful, they worried a lot about missing abuse. Um, they all said to me that they found it very difficult to find information on things like abuse and complaints and aspects of the provider before they went on inspections. If, if they're going on an, a comprehensive inspection, they get a proper provider information report um, that is um, uh, uh, presented to them by the analytics department, that's fine. But the rest of the time, they found it very difficult to access data. So I think there is a need for more accessible data of the dashboard type for um, uh, services so that inspectors can just look, look them up really easily on abuse complaints, staff training, turnover, sickness, bank staff use, levels of restraint, all those kinds of things that are probably crucial. Secondly, I think there need to be more unannounced inspections, including evenings and weekends, because it's clear that people can cover up poor practice given sufficient notice. Um, I think the provider information requests need to be six monthly. And uh, I also think that um, all inspections should provide ratings. There were some inspections, they were focused inspections, but they provided no ratings at all, like uh, inspection six. And I think that's just not helpful. Um, and of course, there there is an issue about the speed of um, providing reports. Um, which I know CQC is already aware of. My third uh, recommendation is about abuse allegations, safeguarding, whistleblowing and retracted uh, allegations. I think they need to be seen as a whole for the service. What tends to happen, especially in um, Durham safeguarding and in other safeguarding um, bodies, they tend to be seen as individual issues to be sorted out. And actually, people hadn't realised uh, how they were escalating for that service as a whole. Now, obviously, recommendation one in relation to the data will help people do that. But I think it needs to be very certainly um, a focus for, for um, services, especially high risk services like these. Um, So, uh, the fourth the fourth recommendation is that service user interviews and carer interviews, I think, need to be given greater priority within the inspection process. They do appear in inspection reports, but they're covered very briefly. Um, and um, often, I think, uh, the uh, specialist advisors are asked to cover those. Um, 
and I suspect they're not given very much um, priority. So I think they need to be much more highly prioritised. And I think inspectors need some extra communication skills to do this kind of work with people with learning disabilities and autism. And of course, those kinds of interviews need to be done in, in private without being overseen by the services staff. My fifth uh, recommendation is about what I've called level two inspections, because I think there needs to be a way of um, engaging in much more in-depth uh, inspection if there are a whole series of red flags about a, a service, which there certainly were with Walton Hall at various times. They had very high levels of restraint. They had very high levels of staff turnover, of uh, use of agency staff. They had very untrained frontline staff. All of those things are uh, absolutely uh, red flags. And, and there needs to be a way of going in and doing a more in-depth uh, inspection in those circumstances, I think, to include more time observing, like a fly on the wall, to include more time, more in-depth service user interviews, uh, ratings of culture, um, and uh, if it's possible, to interview ex-staff. What obviously happened in Walton Hall is staff often left very quickly and I suspect that's because they realised it was an abusive culture and they didn't want to stay. But they are the people who hold uh, very valuable information about a service. And I think that CQC should consider covert surveillance when these red flags are showing that a service is failing. And then my final recommendation is about registration, um, because uh, clearly Walton Hall was a very... Uh, unsuitable building. That's what everybody said. It was uh, a, operating an outdated model of service with very untrained staff um, and uh, really the wrong model of care. Uh, as CQC, I'm sure, is, is aware now. It's very easy to say that in hindsight, of course, but um, I do think uh, those kinds of settings shouldn't be registered. And um, there needs to be some thought given to how to uh, deal with those that are already registered and that are appearing to be a bit like Walton Hall. Um, OK, I'm going to leave it there because I know you want to have a proper discussion. Professor Murphy, thank you very much. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. There are, uh, amongst your recommendations, some things which we have been working on uh, anyway um, uh, for some time, but you, you, you've you really sort of highlighted and emphasised them. I think there's some other things there which, whilst we've discussed in the past, uh, the merits, for example, of announced or unannounced uh, inspections, um, I think you've given us a real focus for, for uh, a lot of further consideration. Uh, and then there's some other things in there which I don't think we probably have given uh, sufficient thought to at all. So uh, I, I just really good. Um, Kate, before we open it up, is this the moment where it would be worth just uh, you saying what we have been doing since uh, Walton Hall and since the, the other report uh, that, that, that we had? And then people have got a sort of complete picture and then we open it up for uh, comments and, and questions to Professor Murphy. Sure. Um, so um, thanks, Peter, and um, a very many thanks to Professor Murphy for her report and for the summary you've just given us. Um, I will um, endeavour to re respond to your question, Peter, but my, um, at the end of my slot, just invite Ted or Ursula to chip in um, just to add anything um, if I've missed, uh, if, if, if there's anything I've missed. Um, sorry, can, can, can I just, sorry, I should have um, introduced, and you mentioned Ursula, I should have said that we've been uh, joined by Ursula Gallagher, who has been doing a lot of the work uh, uh, that we've been doing uh, in, in response to uh, closing Peter, down. And can you see as well? Yeah, I was just going to say, and 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 I see that uh, Dr. Ke Dr. Kevin Cleary, uh, our Deputy Chief Inspector and our Mental Health Lead, is also here. So uh, I think that is a, a complete 
list of the people that are with us now. Sorry, Kate, back to you. Lovely. And just to explain why um, I'm kicking off our response. So I currently chair a programme board called Improving Regulation Today that looks at changes we need to make right here, right now to how we regulate to ensure that people remain safe. Um, so we originally had a work stream within Improving Regulation Today that was looking at um, our response to the David Noble recommendations. And actually, we made a decision that we wanted to bring together all the activity that's going on around closed environments with David Noble's recommendations. And we will also fold in uh, the lessons coming out of um, Professor Murphy's report as well. So we have a single place providing governance and assurance that we are making the changes and implementing the changes that, that we um, are and will commit to. Um, so so that, that's to explain what, what my role is. Um, I'm the senior responsible officer on that um, and obviously working very closely with Ted and, and other colleagues to do that. Um, so I think for me, there are um, kind of strategically, there are a kind of a number of uh, interlinking uh, pieces of work here. The first is kind of fundamentally our approach to how we regulate closed environments. And uh, relatively quickly off the back of um, the Wharton Hall programme um, last year, we worked to develop some uh, supporting guidance to um, uh, equip and, and support our inspectors when they're going into such services. So to help them identify what constitutes a closed environment, but also to think about the, the additional tools they might need to use uh, to ensure that they are really hearing what it feels like to receive that care at 12 o'clock on a Sunday night when, when no one um, no one else, no other visitors are around. Um, so we developed that guidance that includes things such as an increased focus and emphasis on hearing the voice of people with lived experience and their families, including things such as local advocacy organisations, when we are trying to really understand what that quality of care looks like. So that supporting guidance was produced. Um, we always intended to take the learning from Professor Murphy's um, feedback to uh, refresh that guidance, so that will happen now. And that guidance wasn't just for our staff, we predominantly um, developed it for our inspectors, but we also shared it with our colleagues in Health Watch, you do enter and views into such um, uh, environments, but we also shared it with organisations such as the Association of Directors of Adult Services. So um, your, your directors of social care who have uh, commissioners and social workers going into these type of environments as well. So that's a little bit about um, closed environments and the, the thinking about how we should how we should be regulating these types of services, how we have an easily accessible, much more dynamic view of quality um, is, is something that was um, always going to be picked up in our longer term strategy, but actually the work that we'll talk about a bit more later in this board about how we are right here right now responding to um, the challenge that COVID-19 is presenting to us will also help um, accelerate our learning about having that view of quality um, in a much more kind of dynamic, dynamic way than than the way we kind of we currently do that. The two other big strategic pieces is um, obviously the piece of work we've done around re um, restraint, seclusion, and segregation. So this piece of work started um, uh, six months ahead of uh, the Wharton Hall Panorama Programme um, and initially looked at how restraint, seclusion, and segregation was experienced by people in mental health services. And then uh, in phase two, it is also looked at what that means for people in adult social care settings in the community for children in secured units, etc. So that piece of work is um, reaching its conclusion and we have worked absolutely extensively with families and people who have experienced seclusion to um, really hone down what the key recommendations are in this report that are actually going to make the difference. So many people who have been in the kind of learning disability autism sector for a long time will know that there have been numerous reports um, in this area talking about what change needs to happen. And I think there is a feeling that none of this has made the progress that people would have wanted to. So it's critical when our restraint, seclusion, segregation report lands, it lands with a whole, with, with a set of actions that we, across a whole multitude of organisations, um, are ready to deliver and implement and, and really make, um, make the difference. And then the final kind of strategic piece, um, so Professor Murphy talked about our role in terms of regulating uh, the regulating models of care. So um, as, as you all know, uh, about four years ago, we um, implemented some guidance called Registering the Right Support, which looked at our approach based on best practice, nice guidance and best practice about what the model of care should look like for adults with learning disabilities and autism. Um, and it talked about services predominantly being small, being community-based, supporting people to have an ordinary life. 
Um, so for about four years, we have been registering services under that um, remit. And we uh, we started thinking maybe about six months ago about whether that guidance has um, sufficient attention paid to how on an ongoing basis we also regulate to make sure that the right model of care is being delivered for this group of people. So we are in the process of um, refreshing that guidance. It's going to be called Right Care, Right Support, Right Culture. And throughout it, we give examples of what best practice looks like when it comes to um, this type of care. But also we talk about how we, on an ongoing basis, need to be regulating these types of services through the lens of what is the best practice, what is the right model of care for adults with learning disabilities um, and autism. So um, those are a few, few of the bits, Peter. So we've got the, the specific work around um, how we currently now regulate closed environments and have confidence that we understand about the quality. There's the lessons um, from that which will be informing our strategy from 2021 onwards that the current activity around around COVID-19 and how we have a good grip of um, the quality of care when we're maybe not physically as present as we usually would be. And then there's the two strategic pieces of work around restraint, seclusion and segregation and how we register and regulate um, the model of care through a lens of um, the kind of outcomes it's delivering for people um, accessing the community and having as normal a life as possible. So, so if I could just pause there, are you happy, Peter, for me to just check with my colleagues whether I've, whether I've captured everything? Yes. Does anybody want to add well, anything? Can I say a few things, uh, Peter? Is that all right at this point? Yes, of course. Uh, so, so uh, first of all, can I welcome this report? Uh, uh, Professor Murphy has done a very careful study here, and I think it is really important that we take away the learning from it to improve our, our inspection and regulation of these closed environments. But also, I think there are lessons about the wider pattern of our regulation, because one of the key messages for me from this report is that we have to target our inspection methodology uh, in a way that takes into account of the risks of different service sectors. And I don't think our inspection methodology was really focused around the, the risks in closed environments. And that's an important lesson for us. We've moved forward and we've made a lot of progress since then, but Professor Murphy's report I really highlights some really important areas where we need to go further. And I think, as Kate has explained, we need to build on the work we've done so far to make sure that we do have a regulation approach and inspection methodology that really identifies risk and abuse going on in these closed environments. And I think there's really important learning for there. Uh, and P Professor Murphy has, has identified some different approaches that we haven't tried yet, such as the level two inspection, such as the covert surveillance, and such as the, 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 the better way of interviewing and understanding the experience of service users themselves, which I re reading the report was clear, something we had not got right as yet. So I think there's really important learning. So thank you very much, Professor Murphy, for the report. We must build on this going forward. Can I, can I hand over to Kevin at this stage, Peter, just so he, she can, he can reflect on the report? Is that okay? Yes, please, Kevin. Kevin. Hello. Um, I think um, uh, the staff uh, uh, will, in the mental health um, director, will really welcome this report. Um, I think it's very balanced, very helpful. Um, it builds on um, uh, the work that we have uh, been undertaking. Um, I think one of the messages which comes through really clearly is the importance of um, having the data readily accessible. Um, you have to be able to get a full picture um, of what's happening um, uh, in the service at any one particular time. You have to understand the flow of um, information around whistleblowing, uh, abuse allegations, uh, restraints, etc., um, uh, and be able to easily get to that. Um, I think you have to have um, uh, an approach to whistleblowing um, uh, and abuse allegations uh, in which it's sort of seen at a senior level, um, you know, to make sure that everyone is actually looking at this in the same way uh, uh, and is understanding what's happening. Um, I think there is a real, um, uh, one of the messages which has come through quite clearly is you cannot do this remotely. You have to be going into the service um, unannounced, I agree, um, uh, and seeing what is happening um, uh, with your own eyes and talking to patients, talking to service users, in a way which makes sure that you're likely to capture the most important um, information uh, and also uh, that you're talking to staff in a way in which you're sort of likely again to be able to um, access their true opinion about what's happening. Um, and I think the uh, final 
my final comment is around culture. Culture trumps everything. Um, uh, and I really think uh, there's a lot we could probably do around how we assess the culture. There are cultural assessment tools. I've seen them used effectively. Um, it's not just some abstract concept. It is actually what shapes the whole nature of the care that's been provided. Um, and so I really think that's something that we would like to take forward. Uh, but, you know, on behalf of all the staff and my director, I'd like to thank Professor Murphy for what she's done. Thank you. Thanks. So can, can I open it up now um, to colleagues to either ask questions or, or make comments? It's Liz here, Peter. Could I come in? Yes, please, um, Liz. Yeah, so first of all, I thought this was a, a really clearly analysed report um, and I particularly welcome the focus both on what data can tell us. So, you know, the, the, the recommendation for simple graphical information that shows you trends in things like the use of restraint or the number of complaints, um, coupled with, as Kevin was just saying, you know, you, you have to actually hear from people with lived experience and from advocates and from family members and from members of staff and former members of staff. It's that real interaction and observation. Uh, so it's both. It's both the data and the direct interaction. Um, and, um, and I think there's lots of sort of uh, specifics in this report that should be really useful. And I look forward to the, the board hearing, for, hearing about our progress in implementing some of the ideas like the, the um, second tier of inspection, um, making sure that we are interviewing people in private, making sure that we have got our staff with the right skills to interview people who may have communication challenges and all of that, um, because I think these are massively important things. And I, I, I think there's an opportunity here for a step change in, in uh, assuring um, the safety and well-being of people who are in such environments. But I also very strongly welcome the focus on the model. And we've said in our restraint uh, seclusion segregation report that, um, you know, we don't think that this is the right model. Uh, and um, it's not fit for purpose. Uh, and um, so I think that this this process that Kate mentioned of engaging on um, an approach to regulation that goes, you know, not just registering the right support, but actually regulating the support right through the regulatory process to ensure that we are, if you like, incentivizing, encouraging the types of models of support that actually support people's human rights and people's ability to live a decent life free of the kind of abuse that we unfortunately saw at Wilton Hall. Thank you, Liz, I agree. Other comments from colleagues? Can I have a go, Peter? Please do. Um, um, firstly, firstly, Professor Murphy, thank firstly. you very much for this report. And I, I particularly appreciated the way in which you've set out in effect, all the information that each of these inspections, each of the interactions produced and how that looks cumulatively. Uh, and um, it, it, of course, has huge echoes in relation to other other uh, previous scandals, Winterbourne View and even mid staffs. And the common feature there, it seems to me, is that in effect, um, the poor standards and so on were actually hiding in plain sight, but no one seemed to put it together. Uh, and I think that's a huge lesson to learn. Um, the point I'd like to focus on today, perhaps not surprisingly coming from me, is the information that came from complaints from service users, whistleblowers, members of staff and so on. And what struck me reading your report was the value placed or the weight placed on those seem to be, in retrospect, surprisingly little. And I wonder whether there's anything specific to this sector which leads, rightly or wrongly, to less credence being given to people with learning disabilities when they say something has happened to them than perhaps would be the case elsewhere. Maybe not, because obviously at mid-staffs, uh, patients complained and their, their, their uh, complaints were discounted as well. But I, I, I do wonder whether there is, um, in effect, too much of a focus on 
whether there is evidence to support the complaint that is made, which inevitably there will not be uh, in, in a closed community where things such as the shocking scenes we saw in Panorama uh, develop. Uh, and one needs to say, well, when uh, someone makes that complaint, what does the fact that that complaint is being made tell us about the institution from which it's coming? And particularly when there's a certain level of these things, does it not get to a level where it doesn't look like maliciousness, malice on the part of one or two people, but some consistent pattern? And I just do wonder and worry um, that when really serious allegations are made, they they don't immediately produce a shock to the system. And, and the fact that there is no evidence to support them is not in itself necessarily a reason for being satisfied uh, that the residents are actually safe. Whereas they may, if the, there is no evidence, for instance, which positively says there was no abuse, then it, that in itself may be evidence that the risk is, is, is there. Uh, I may not have put that wholly clearly, but I just wonder what, what your comments are, Professor, on uh, how one an, an, an attitude change could help to make sure these things don't happen again. Well, thank you for that. I, I agree with you. The the um, the evidence I read in the various uh, allegations of abuse m made me feel that they weren't being taken as seriously as they should have been. And I think one of the very big problems was that um, many of them, many of the allegations that uh, service users made were retracted. Um, and you can see that in the um, big table of allegations um, that came from the Durham safeguarding. And I think it's very easy to brush those off especially for people with learning disabilities, as false allegations. And, uh, you know, they probably weren't. And it's quite likely that having made an allegation and maybe an excellent staff member, because there were some good staff members, I'm pretty certain, would have reported it. But then an unscrupulous staff member comes and leans on the person to retract it and I, I think um, not just C CQC, CQC, but also um, the local authority and probably the CCG as well, were too ready to believe that um, these were all uh, service users who were making false allegations. Uh, and I think certainly seeing a lot of retracted allegations ought to be a really red flag um, because it probably does mean that something terrible is going on. If I could just come come back uh, on that for a, a moment, I mean, clearly this area is relevant not just to this type of closed community. It's relevant to those detained under the Mental Health Act. It's relevant to uh, prisoners, mm, uh, yeah. and, and um, where they're a layman may be tempted to believe that uh, individuals are trying to manipulate a, a, a system. And um, just as we tend to, we, I think you're, you suggest, and I, I think it's the learning, that um, a, 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 a being an outlier in the use of restraint is in itself a red flag. Mm. Shouldn't the fact of allegations being made and the quantity of them also be a red flag, which justifies intervention, even if it's impossible to prove the individual cases. Now, it's uh, now, of course, the provider will always say, well, you can't show that any of this is happening, to which I would suggest that the response might be, well, you can't show it's not. And we have people in your care who are therefore at risk. One needs to develop that sort of attitude. Um, rather than re an attitude which is, could we prove this at a criminal court? Absolutely. I, I thoroughly agree. And it was clear from the data I had that um, the number of allegations was escalating. So, you know, that's that's obviously a clue to something. And it seemed to be running alongside very high rates of restraint. And I think 
going back to your original point about whether this is a population where those kinds of things can be dismissed, I think it, it does often get dismissed for people with learning disabilities and autism on the grounds that, well, these are very challenging clients and that's why they're here and that's why we have to restrain them. Um, but um, all of those things seem to me to be going together and I absolutely agree, of course, abuse allegations should be part of the red flags. Um, and uh, the um, work that's being done by your analytics department, developing the insight tool, I had a look at the insight tool for a couple of the uh, places it had been used for. And I think it's really very good because it, it does show exactly that kind of uh, data that you need to look at if you're an inspector about to go in. Peter, could I just come back briefly? Uh, it, it's Liz here. Um, I suppose I would just like some assurance that we're, we're thinking about how our inspectors, uh, if you like, um, stand firm when members of staff and managers are trying to give you assurance um, that, you know, oh, these, these allegations were retracted or whatever. Because I think, you know, we know that in relation to people with learning disabilities, people with mental health conditions, there is unfortunately uh, a tendency for all sorts of people to give their views and that state of experience less weight than the weight of professionals. And our job is to give those views real weight uh, and not be um, not be sort of uh, inappropriately reassured. And I suppose I'd just like to know that our staff really have that confidence and that knowledge base to think in those sort of human rights terms that everybody's view must count. Kate, do you want to respond on that? And um, while you're well, after that, I, I'd like to go back, because I think it's linked to, uh, I think it was you, Robert, but somebody said earlier, what, what, what I found, Professor Murphy, really compelling in your report was when you laid out the narrative of, of everything that was known over a period of time, it, 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 it gave such sort of a clarity of, of, of what was probably going on that was missed when you looked at each individual uh, inspection. Mm -hmm. And then aligned with that, the, the, the comment that inspectors found it difficult to access the, the data. And, and I'm not sure whether it's Mark or, or Ian who would want to respond, but we, we have been doing quite a lot of thinking about, about that, uh, some of which we'll cover later in the, the, the agenda. But I, but I think to your point, Liz, if, you, if you've got that, that clear narrative and you've got all the data and you're seeing this escalation of um, uh, 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 complaints and, 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 and uh, concerns, that then it's, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's more, more compelling and therefore more difficult just to say these are, these are people that are making trouble or, or being difficult. Um, but Kate, do you want to respond? Yes, so um, again, happy to kick off Peter and then whether um, Ted or um, Kevin want to talk a bit more specifically about um, this uh, this type of environment. So um, so in our uh, supporting guidance about how we should be regulating um, closed environment, environments, we've been absolutely ex explicit that they should involve experts by experience. So, so that, that is out there and, and that is happening. What was interesting about Professor Murphy's uh, reflections was um, this kind of challenge or this opportunity for us to reflect on um, how much of that gathering and hearing the voice of people with lived experience is left to our experts by experience? And actually, should that be a supplement and an enhancement of those direct conversations inspectors are having privately with people who uh, have care and support needs? Um, and, and a follow-up question is also about us being assured that our inspectors have the confidence and the skills about managing communication. So for example, interacting with someone maybe who doesn't have verbal communication, how, how, how do you take the time? How might you use an advocate to be really confident that you're, you're finding out what, what their experiences is? So um, we captured the expert by experience requirement within our supporting guidance on a, a kind of a, a kind of separate issue. We are re-looking at how we as an organisation use experts by experience and what their contribution should be to an inspection, which is the point I just made. Their contribution should be to add colour and um, should help us triangulate findings that we are going out and directly hearing as well from people who, who receive, receive services. 
Um, Ted, I don't know whether you or Kevin want to talk a bit more about um, this scenario. Well, well, can, can I just build on the point that Robert was making there, which I think is really a very important one, and, and that is that, that I think uh, leading up to Walton Hall, we were, we were too focused on identifying whether abuse was occurring rather than identifying whether this was a high-risk environment for abuse. Uh, and I think we, the, the guidance we've developed since then has very much talked about the environment and the risk and, and, and as taking action on, uh, on the risk rather than focusing on whether uh, abuse was proven or not. And I think reading Professor Murphy's report, it was very clear of the risks that they were at Wharton Hall. But because we didn't get to the point of proving abuse was taking place, to some extent, we stood back. And I think, think that was the challenge to us. We need to be more proactive in identifying and acting on risk rather than waiting for things to be proven. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's, that's an important learning for us if, if for these kind of environments. Kevin, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I'll just... Um, so um, I think uh, these are definitely um, uh, unquestionably high-risk uh, environments. Um, uh, I think that uh, the way that you look at whistleblowing uh, uh, and... Uh, staff allegations um, has to be sort of with the aim of getting a whole picture. Um, we're not there to uh, make sure that the allegations are proved. Uh, that's not our role. We, should, we have to be listening to that information um, uh, and uh, acting on it, uh, uh, acting on it quickly. And I think actually in the last, since I've been here, um, we we have been acting on it. We have closed a number of hospitals of this type, or we have put them in special measures, and have undertaken a series of unannounced uh, inspections. So I think it probably has shifted um, already the thinking um, of the teams in relation to how we respond to these allegations. But I do think uh, there's further work to be done, um, uh, and it's the importance of it being sort of listened to at a senior level, um, and having a senior review of this. Uh, from my experience of working in an organisation, you know, working in the trust, uh, it's for the senior leadership to take um, interest uh, uh, in allegations in quality of care that's being provided and not just being left at the uh, inspector and inspection manager level. Peter, can I come in, please? Yes, please, Ian. Yeah, thank you. I mean, Professor Murphy, again, I just want to reiterate the thanks of, of other people. I think this is a this has been a really important piece of work. I think there's a, a number of things that uh, that you've pulled out here. I think one is you've taken a very broad view of what's happened. And, and I, I was particularly struck by this interplay of regulators, uh, providers, CCGs and the police and the fact that in order to to regulate a high risk environment effectively, it needs more than just the conventional regulator, um, it needs a group of people. Um, so I think there's important lessons for us, but there's also important lessons I think for other agencies that were involved in Walton Hall and are currently involved in regulating other similar high risk environments. Um, I, I do also appreciate your recognising the commitment of our teams. I, I, I know um, we all felt um, absolutely devastated by by what had gone on at Walton Hall, and I think, mm -hmm. I, I think as our teams have 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 looked at this again and again, I think I think that that has not improved. We 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 still feel that uh, that we could we could have done better as a, as a collective, um, but I think the fact that you've recognised the personal commitment of individuals and the, and those teams, I think, has been is really appreciated. I I, I think the other thing that has struck me about about this is although the report is focused on learning disability and autism services in particular. I think actually it has an applicability across pretty much everything we do. That there are there are versions of closed environments in, in most of the services that we regulate. Um, and I think there are some lessons for us. You know, the, the lessons here will 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 will, uh, will be very much more widespread. I think to pick up on the specific point that Peter was inviting me to comment on around around um, around the uh, being intelligence driven. I think it's worth worth saying that our transformation work over the last uh, over the last year or so has been absolutely focused on putting the best information into the hands of inspectors to support their decisions. Um, and although a lot of that has been pretty technical in the background, the reality is it is about make meaning that at that moment of truth when an inspector is on the ground, they have the very latest position both from CQC data, but also from data from other other organisations, um, and they're able to to bring all of that together in one place and make and make the, the right decision. Um, I think one final point. Um, I, I 
I look forward to the next phase of this work. I know I know there's a there's a follow on piece of work here. And I'm particularly interested in, in this point that a couple of people have made around what action short of prosecution might look like. Um, I, I think various people have said that you know, we tend to look for evidence to pursue a prosecution. And, and when we can't find that, then then when we don't feel we're able to act. And I, and I think there is something here for me around um, how we might uh, how we might be true to our purpose of promoting improvement by taking some sort of action that is not necessarily prosecution, but it, it does drive uh, improvement. It does it does veer away from a situation where somebody is abused. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Professor Murphy, you've been very quiet listening to us. Very nice of you. Did, is there anything that we've said you want to uh, uh, either add to or, or, or disagree with or reflect on? Uh, uh, and is there anything else you wanted to say to us today? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, I, I've been impressed by how open CQC has been to considering its processes and its ways of working. Um, because I think you're all very keen to try to avoid this happening again. I have to say that I think it will be very difficult because even if we do all the things in my recommendations, it may be very difficult to um, detect abuse where there is a group of people who are very, very clever at disguising it. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think we have to uh, try to make things as good as we possibly can. Um, I do think they are very high risk services, these. And, um, you know, there's a long history um, going way back of abusive practices in these kinds of environments. So, you know, I think they are particularly high risk and we just have to do everything we possibly can to try to um, improve them. I agree. Thank you. And and uh, Ian just mentioned a minute ago that, that there is a, a second part to your work, which, which again, I'm very grateful for. And I think in, in that second part, uh, I think you're hoping to be able to uh, engage um, with uh, uh, service users and their, and, and their families uh, more than you were able to in the first part. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, and what we also hope to do um, is to look at uh, international experts who have um, examined ways of uh, rating um, environments, cultures, um, as well as um, maybe uh, developing performance indicators that relate to outcome. Um, so that, that's also part of uh, what we plan to do. We may have to do it slightly differently than we'd intended given the COVID-19 crisis. But um, yeah, that's part of what we're doing. Great. So thank you again. Um, you obviously will be back with us in due course. Uh, if we're still having to uh, have uh, our board meetings virtually, uh, we might even manage to get you a camera by next time you come so we could see you as well as uh, as hear you, although we could hear you very clearly, which was, which was great. Uh, and when you do come back again, hopefully you will see that we've made uh, a, a lot more progress than we've already made uh, in implementing the changes that uh, you and indeed David Noble previously have, have recommended. So can I thank you and also uh, Kevin, thank you for joining us and, and Ursula as well. And uh, let's let's just hope that um, the the uh, attention that Walton Hall has brought to, to everybody uh, does significantly reduce the chances of uh, another situation arising. Although, as you rightly say, uh, if people are determined enough and dishonest enough, it, it, it can't be guaranteed. It doesn't happen. Thank you very much, Professor Murphy. Thank you as well from my end. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So lots of work uh, that we need to do before Professor Murphy comes back to us. Um, uh, Ian, can we move on to the the uh, e executive team's re uh, report? And I think the the, the main item uh, that we want to talk about is the response to COVID-19. But uh, as I said earlier, there are other things going on that we need to bring to the board as well. So do you want to kick off, Ian? 
Thanks, Peter. Um, what I want to do is just say a, a few words about our COVID-19 response, and then I'm going to ask each of the directors in turn to talk about their particular areas. The three chief inspectors around our, our regulatory response, uh, Chris Day around our external response, um, and then Kirsty around how we as, a, as an organisation are preparing, and then, and then finish up with Mark around some of the technology things that we're doing and the particular piece of work we're doing to try and um, make sure that we can operate uh, completely remotely. Um, but I think I just want to set the scene a little bit for, for board members, although there is a... Um, there is a paper in the in, in the board papers uh, which sort of summarise a lot of things we're doing. Uh, to, to be frank, you know, it, it becomes almost instantly out of date because of the pace of work. Um, things are literally changing on an hour by hour basis at the moment. Um, and and I, I think we we have always started from the from the point of view of what is our core purpose. Um, and, and our core purpose as an organisation has been to has been to reassure the public around safety and quality of the care care, care services that they are are, are using um, and to promote improvement. And, and I feel very strongly that that core purpose of around safety and promoting improvement is, is as relevant today uh, as it frankly it's ever been um, but the way in which we go about uh, discharging that responsibility is profoundly different um, to the to um, to the way the way we normally do it um, and, and I think we have to see uh, see that see uh, see the fact that we will change very significantly the manner in which we we do our job but over an extended period of time, I think we need to see that we need to recognise that that whilst people are rightly talking about preparing for the next week, the next month, uh, realistically, I think we have to prepare um, for the next year. There will be disruption to what we do over the next year, and we'll certainly still be talking about this actively during during the rest of 2020. So, uh, and we know that as as we come out of the other side, we'll have to be very flexible about our thinking, and and, and arguably, the way we do our job may never be the same again because of the lessons that we learned during COVID-19. So, so, I think that sense of of profound change is an important one for us to uh, us to, us to realise and and understand. I think in terms of some very practical things that we we've, we've done in the short term. Um, what we've recognised is there's a need to very rapidly register services. So, uh, and, and that means they will, that we won't be asking all of the normal questions that we ask uh, for a number of services. But where we've got a COVID-19 service in particular, or, a, or an existing service wants to flex its registration, we will be, we will be um, changing that registration very, very quickly and in a matter of, in some cases, a matter of hours. Um, and and we, we don't want to be in the way of a service getting on and doing the things that, that it will need to do. Um, we, on Monday, we suspended all routine inspections, which means that, that we won't be doing any more routine inspections, but what we will be doing is responding to specific risks. So, for example, we've just been talking to Professor Murphy around, around uh, allegations of abuse that were found at Walton Hall. In, in that example, I think the public would rightly expect us to use our, our, our existing powers to, to, uh, to take action to protect people. Um, yeah, I would expect that these things will continue to happen. Um, it, they will happen, I hope, in incredibly rare circumstances, but, but we, we, it is important that we retain that right to act um, in the event that it's needed in those extreme circumstances. If we're not doing inspections, we're also not not rating either. So I don't expect us to be to be rating uh, services. And the same applies for enforcement. We'll take enforcement action uh, when there's there's extreme risk and there's extreme um, extreme uh, extreme danger to to, to people. Um, but I don't see us uh, taking enforcement action of, if you like, a more ordinary sort um, because we simply won't be gathering the evidence um, to, to do that. I think we, we have to have to remember though that that we have a, a duty both to providers but also to COVID-19 patients themselves uh, and also those who use health and social care normally. Um, women will still be having babies during this period. People will still need surgery. Uh, people will be detained in mental health wards and people will still need social care in all its forms. Um, and, and we need to be make sure that we we are protecting the interests of all of those people alongside the the obvious focus on on COVID nineteen. 
And I think that, that independent voice that we offer across the whole of, of the health and social care system is really important. And a voice also that can convene social care providers to pass messages to and from government uh, becomes really, really important at, at this time as well. So I, I think my, my final message to providers really is that is that we're going to do everything in our power to ensure that providers can act to deliver the best possible care for for, for patients given the circumstances and we recognize as we recognize that we we are in extraordinary times and so delivering even the basics of care are going to be really really difficult and we absolutely understand that but nothing the CQC is aiming to do um, should should stop providers from from delivering the sort of care that that we, we all frankly want to be delivered so if I could uh, if I could just hand over to Ted initially just to talk about the work that he's doing and then work my way through from there Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, uh, I've worked in the NHS over many years and have worked in it when it's been under intense pressure before, uh, and I have every confidence that the staff in the NHS will rise to the challenges being uh, uh, given to them in this in this situation. But this, is, this to some extent, is exceptional. It's probably the biggest challenge the NHS has faced uh, for many years, if at all in that not only is this a, a severe challenge, but it is likely to last for quite a while. And even the most benign scenario uh, about the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is going to severely test uh, acute hospital services and the rest of the health and social care system. So it, it's very important that, that we find new ways of, of supporting and regulating the system under these circumstances. And I'm pleased we've stopped the routine inspections and uh, the routine information collection from, from NHS providers. I think it's important we give them the space and help them free up capacity to focus on the, the care of, uh, of people who need their care. Uh, and that really tests us, as, as Ian was saying, to move to a different approach using data uh, uh, in a much more uh, effective way to monitor what's going on. And also things like staff raising concerns with us, I'd encourage staff to feel free to raise concerns with us about what is going on and keep us informed. And of course, people are using services and their carers have got a new pathway through give feedback on care uh, and I think it's very important we use that to maximum to hear what people's experiences really are. We're already hearing from staff about shortages of ICU capacity, uh, protective equipment and staffing problems and particularly in the southeast of England at the moment uh, and that's a sign that day, day by day the pressures are increasing on services. And it's really important that we as regulators keep in touch with what, with the issues facing the frontline services on a day-by-day -day basis. And we're exploring every possible way of doing that without adding ex any extra burden to staff uh, and the services themselves. We still have a purpose, our purpose, our primary purpose of making sure people receive safe care. But safe care means something different when services are under enormous pressure. And it's very important that we are proportionate and reflect the fact that we are asking services to provide the safest care they can under the circumstances that, that they face, with the pressures they face, with the staffing restrictions they face because of the, uh, uh, the, the, the epidemic, and of course, with the limited, limitation of resources they face. And I think we're going to need to work with, with, uh, with, with uh, providers to make sure we understand the pressures facing them and can make the right judgments, but wherever possible, provide support uh, by uh, helping them explore uh, and access the support they need when they're under particular difficulties. So I, I think there is a big challenge to the system uh, going forward, and there's a big challenge to us in terms of regulation. Uh, and I'm really uh, uh, keen that we should learn uh, on a day-by-day -day basis how we can support the system under, under the pressure it's facing. Thanks, Ted. If I could move on to Rosie. Yes, certainly, Ian. So um, if I could just go through my different sectors and explain some of the concerns in, and what we're seeing in the different sectors. So certainly we stepped down routine inspections uh, a couple of weeks ago in our 111 and out of hours providers because um, of the demand that they're seeing. And there's no doubt because of, of the pressures in the system, there's huge demand going through that sect, those sectors. We're hearing a, a mixed picture from uh, GP colleagues who, um, in some cases, they are seeing a significant increase in demand. Um, in some cases, uh, uh, the, 
that the patient population are heeding the messages that are going out about calling 111 rather than turning up at the surgery, um, which is, is uh, absolutely the, the right thing to do uh, if people have got symptoms uh, suggestive of COVID or, or, or flu-like symptoms. Um, so we are working um, to understand how we really identify um, uh, the, the the kind of key risks in the the sector and actually look at how we can support uh, the sector during that time. Um, in in dental services, uh, the, we are hearing increasing concerns about uh, the availability of uh, PPE, of protective equipment, um, and uh, feeding that back. And we're also um, under helping support particularly the private dentists in how we can get messages to them um, uh, some of the ones who who may not be linked into through the um, NHS channel so we are working with that sector to understand how we can support specific messages um, independent doctors um, they are they've got a significant role to play in supporting the capacity within the NHS and they're very keen to do that um, However, we are hearing the odd case now of, of people trying to profit here through this situation. And I think it's very important for us to send out a message that we don't feel that uh, profiteering through this situation is at all appropriate and, and we, we don't tolerate that at all. Um, we know in these situations, sometimes a very small minority of people can use uh, a crisis to exploit people. And I think we need to be very um, have our ears to the ground to that to make sure that that people are not exploited through this um, emergency situation. In our defence medical services, we've suspended the programme and we're working with the defence medical services regulator to look at how we can um, ensure that we follow up on any kind of key risks that we've identified with services there. Um, Health and justice uh, services, we're working with um, some of the other regulators, such as Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, because I think um, we do have a variety of vulnerable groups um, across a whole variety of sectors that we need to work out how we pay particular attention to and how we make sure that, uh, that get the right support. And we know with health and justice services, uh, sometimes they, they have difficulty accessing um, healthcare when due to lack of staff in good times. So actually, we need to make sure that people do have correct access to healthcare um, during these more difficult times. Uh, likewise, we're working with our children's uh, services. We're working with Ofsted because I think we need to understand particularly the vulnerable groups that uh, we normally uh, support with our special educational needs work, for example, and uh, consider how as regulators we continue to support um, safe care um, into those environments um, at a time when people might be feeling more stressed, more anxious, risks may go up um, as a result of that. So I think that's very important. Um, our medicines team are um, looking at how we can understand uh, issues with medicines that might emerge from this. I know that there has been some messaging, which actually we, we very much support that people should not um, over order any medication during this period of time. And I think that's a, a very important message and our medicines team will be looking to see how we can support that those messages. Um, and finally, I think there is an opportunity for us to look at our integrated care work through this. So um, I think we need to, more than ever for our teams within CQC to be working in a local area across all of the directorates so they can really understand that picture in the local um, region across adult social care, hospital teams and uh, primary medical services. We already know that uh, we've heard some stories of people um, having a problematic discharge pathways from hospital, um, of, of those kind of real key issues that fall between the gaps of, of all of the different providers that I think more than ever we need to understand and work out how we can support. Um, and I'm, um, we're also with those local teams uh, looking at how we can plug into the regional incident support teams um, and use the intelligence that are coming out of that local teams to really support that um, sharing of best practice and identification 
of risks. Um, I would just uh, echo uh, Ted's point about raising concerns. More than ever, it's, a, it's important that people do raise concerns with us, um, and we do understand those. And we are already having concerns being raised, for example, by GPs who haven't got the, the protective equipment that they were expecting. Um, and so I think it's important that we, we hear those concerns so we can flag them both nationally and into these regional incident units. Okay. Just like to get from there. Um, so uh, in, in social care, um, we at CQC have quite a unique overview of the 23,500 providers across the country um, uh, providing support to people with, with care and support needs. And because of that, a bit like um, Ian said at the front, it's more important than, than ever that we are involved and having a really good understanding about what the COVID-19 impact is on those individuals. So what does it mean to be an adult of working age with physical disabilities in the coming weeks and months um, as uh, as the impact of this is, is, is truly felt? So, so we, um, we see our role uh, in the social care sector in the coming weeks and months in terms of having a really good view of the impact, um, being able to escalate concerns. So there's a particular conversation going on at the moment about uh, the ability to access the right uh, personal protective equipment um, to provide uh, support to people uh, during this time. So we need to ensure that we've got a good grasp of what the impact is so that we can escalate and carry on having conversations with government and within those regional areas to be talking with health partners as well about, about the impact. Um, this for me is about constantly flagging uh, people with care and support needs as a really important factor in this. So um, conversations are happening as you'd expect around hospitals and making sure that there are sufficient beds to be able to respond um, to the, the increased in demand. What's really important is that should people be leaving hospital sooner than they would have done um, in this current circumstance, that they are supported to transfer safely and that the care services and the community health services are, are ready to uh, pick up that, that care and support. So it's as, as seamless as ever. Um, our social care providers welcomed the decision to um, uh, step away from routine inspection and move to our risk-based um, risk based approach. And we've been talking um, very publicly about the increased emphasis on providing support to providers. So saying to our social care providers, if you've got significant concerns about workforce, if there are things going on in your service that are affecting your ability to provide safe care, pick up the phone to your local inspector. Let's have a conversation about how we can all get through these kind of unprecedented times together. Great. Thanks, Kate. If I can ask Chris to talk about uh, our external perspective. Sure. Um, so just to follow up on my uh, chief inspector colleagues, we've been working uh, nationally with partners around how we join up our support with other regulators so there's consistent messages coming from all of us around our approach to COVID. We've also particularly been working with partners in health including NHS England around how and, and public health England around how we support communications both to public and to provider groups and we've actually embedded some of our staff in the NHS England cells uh, particularly supporting communications for adult social care. In terms of providers, we've been sharing some of the guidance um, through through bulletins and special briefings. There's been support for the idea of webinars, so we're going to test that idea out with different groups so they can have real-time information from us and from other partners. We are maintaining regular contact with the trade associations, as Kate mentioned, and they are a really good source of those, both of information and of, informa and of feedback on how our messages are, are landing with the sector. I think it's important that our focus now moves to how we understand the emerging situation so we can help those um, regional response centres, but also so that how we can make sure that there's appropriate action as, as the situation emerges differently in different areas. So we're looking at how we can um, work with particularly adult social care providers and also their trade associations to support our adoption of that, um, that uh, new methodology. In terms of public, as already been mentioned, we've been speaking to uh, over 200 organisations that represent different uh, different groups of the public around how we promote give, give feedback on care, and particularly how we hear the voice of um, of different groups at this time. We've been using experts by experience in a new way to gather some of that um, that information, and we've been handling a high volume of uh, of both uh, social media calls and uh, give feedback on care returns. I think. Um, as Rosie mentioned, that there's been a, a step up increase in people's uh, uh, using those tools as a, as a means of giving us voice back. And it's important we can play that back in to both the regional and the national picture. 
uh, just say internally as well, we've been making sure staff are fully briefed in, in terms of uh, what's going on. We have uh, daily daily updates for colleagues and then um, uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday briefings for senior managers and managers so they feel equipped to have the right conversations with uh, with colleagues on, on the ground. We'll, we'll continue to maintain that as we go through this next period of time. And we've been working closely with the media to make sure that our their, their understanding of our approach and also their understanding of partners' approach is maintained and also we can have a good conversation about areas outside COVID where they still have interest. Thanks, Chris. If, can I come to Kirsty and ask her just to talk about our, our internal readiness? Yeah, thank you. So we've um, we've been doing a number of things. We've put some programme uh, activity around this. So we've put some programme managers in. So we take a programme approach to uh, looking at all the various activities to ensure that we are, we're, we've got a good oversight. We're moving things forward at the pace that they need to do. And we're managing any interdependencies between the work. Uh, we've been doing some work around uh, contingency planning and looking at our scenarios, working through uh, the sort of must do, should do, could do's and identifying the resources required to enable us to do that so that we can scenario plan for if we get to sort of critical threshold levels and what we do in the event of that. We've also been doing some other scenario planning work, looking at various scenarios, both for internal impacts, but also uh, wider strategic scenarios and putting together our, our sort of our, our policy position on on all of these and a sort of a must uh, implementation plan so that we can implement quickly if needs must. We have been doing stress testing over the last week of our systems to ensure that we can put people out uh, and working at home. So last week we ran over the last week we ran a series of act of activities where we moved. Uh, chunks of people out from NCSC who are primarily office based. Uh, we did that in rotation to check if the connectivity and that could work. Uh, and then yesterday we, we fortuitously asked everybody to work at home across the whole organisation to test that and, and that went fine. Uh, in terms of our people policies, we are uh, putting in place policies to ensure that we can provide support and guidance to our people who are also working at home and who are having to self isolate and who are ill. Uh, we're looking at how we might do that if schools are closed and the impact on our people in terms of how they work and uh, also collecting data through sickness recording so we can keep track of uh, the health of our, of our own workforce. Um, we are also keeping track of people on loan and secondment and we have been uh, providing uh, people from CQC out both to support the sort of government response but also out to frontline and we're keeping a track of those and facilitating those risk requests where we can. Um, and we're also now looking at if we do have spare capacity in the organisation where people have not been, uh, as we've suspended um, uh, our routine inspections for the, for the moment, what we can do with uh, our people who are, uh, who are not uh, out on inspections. And we're looking at how we can utilise their skills, knowledge and experience to help us uh, accelerate some of our work around our change programme so that we uh, we can uh, do some of our uh, user led design uh, at an earlier stage than we perhaps had envisaged around the programme of work. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, Mark, finally. Yes, I think just briefly from me, we've been working uh, at pace over the last um, uh, a couple of weeks to stand up some technology quickly that will enable us to uh, really uh, very quickly support the the efforts around being able to continue um, ensuring that uh, the safety and promoting improvement within providers. Um, we've had um, a number of uh, workshops with with um, cross discipline support from across the organisation to devise um, <clears throat> new methodology for managing to provide that insurance um, in a way that is uh, streamlined and provides um, you know, and, 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 and is simple and, and, and quick for us to implement and, um, uh, and doesn't uh, uh, give any undue burden on, on providers. Um, we, we've had some superb support from Microsoft who are an existing um, provider uh, around our, our current environment. Um, uh, in helping us design some quick solutions and we're looking to, to um, establish an environment uh, that will enable us to do this in a, in a very short space of time. Um, this will enable us to, to, to collect data um, and to support um, providers, even if we're doing that remotely. Um, 
that we talked quite a bit about data um, already today, and we're, we're going to be uh, increasing our, um, our our efforts to make sure that the data that we are uh, we're already um, uh, uh, consuming and providing analytics around is is informing um, the decisions we make around where we focus our our efforts, um, and that that work will continue. Um, we also are, are standing up some technology to be able to support um, with coordinating information across the adult social care and independent health area where we're, we're uniquely placed um, to be able to gather um, information and provide support. Um, uh, and uh, the, the hope is that with that, um, with that tool, we'll be able to provide a, a picture across the, uh, the adult social care landscape about particularly about what pressures and what challenges that they're facing during this time. That's it thanks, for me. Mark. Thank uh, thanks, Mark. Peter, I hope uh, that gives you a sense of, of, a, a, of work, a significant amount of work across the whole organisation that's both trying to get us as an organisation ready uh, for what's going to be a difficult time internally, but also, more importantly, what we're doing externally uh to to make to ensure that that the public are reassured by the health and social care systems that they are they are using and that where we can that we continue to promote improvement thanks peter uh, th thank you and, and thank all of you because there's a huge amount of work going on uh, led by by you guys obviously but a lot of our staff are doing some fantastic things at the moment so thanks to everybody can i just invite my uh, non-executive colleagues if there's anything they want to ask or add just on the the, the COVID-19 response and then there's a few other uh, small pieces of uh, or relatively small uh, other things that we want to talk about uh, in your executive report but just on the COVID-19 is anything anybody wants to add? Peter, um, could I, I please, to, um, um, sorry one at a time. Come on John. Uh, firstly thank you to everybody for what you're doing not just on behalf of the board, but I guess on behalf of citizens, since in some sense we're here representing that. Um, the public discourse on COVID-19 has been predominantly around the NHS uh, and its response, and, and that's clearly very important. But the country isn't going to get through this unless there's uh, an equivalent... Uh, uh, focus also on social services and their ability to respond and uh, we already highlighted in state of care the parlous nature of social care and I do worry um, about that lack of conversation and I say that as somebody who has been steeped in the NHS for all of their career. Carers are going to need protective equipment just in the same way as NHS staff. Care services are not going to be able to deliver quite as they have been just in the same way as the NHS. The NHS has been promised all the resources that it needs. In my view, that promise should be extended to social care services too. They are going to need all the resources they need. And I hope uh, that we will be able to use our independent voice to articulate urgently, both publicly and in the corridors of power, how important that will be for the country to overcome this crisis. Thank you, John. Um, so, so just to give you that assurance, so that, that is absolutely what I see our role is. Our role is to talk and to continue talking about people with care and support needs. Not everyone who's going to be affected by this are, are people aged over uh, 70, 85. This will absolutely affect adults of working age as well who have care and support needs. And our job, I think, is to have a comprehensive picture about what the impact is yeah. so that we can work within regions to ensure that those, uh, those needs are being met, but also so we can have those conversations with government and with the public to say, this whole system only works if social care is given the right attention and resources it needs along with our health partners we're two halves of the same whole good thank you robert were, were you trying to come in earlier as well um 
I wasn't, but I did want to come in. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay. much. laughs> um, well, I was waiting. My I was waiting my turn, unlike some others. You know. um, <laughs> so uh, uh, now the point I, I was going to ask about all, was this: that we we have a role as a regulator in terms of uh, policing, if you like, um, minimum standards and so on, and we have a role in terms of uh, rating. And it, it, it seems to me that. Um, from what you're saying quite properly, is, is that we are now more focusing on, on looking at the uh, what what safety and so on looks like in, in these exceptional times. Um, but and I was relieved to hear you say that, for instance, in relation to um, equipment and being given to staff, that that was something with, with which we should be interested. Um, I mean, it's not the only issue, but it happens to be the current one in the in the news about concerns being raised by staff both in the healthcare sector and social care sectors about the lack of protection they get and and i my, one question i have is well what if if we as an organization or in a particular place or area an inspector feels uh, that things are not safe what is actually going to what are we actually going to do about that for point one and point two is a rather more general one, but we, we clearly have a number of organisations in special measures who are inadequate already. Um, does our surveillance of those change in this different climate? And if so, how? So do you, shall I start on those two points? Um, so I think the, the work we need to do um, going forward really needs to link into those regional instance centres. I think we're one of the few organisations, or if not the only organisation, that has that overview of all the different sectors, including sectors that aren't necessarily plugged into some of the NHS work. And we've talked about adult social care, but also independent health um, settings. And I think we have a role really to be looking at how we can firstly flag all of those issues and collect them and use that as intelligence to feed into the national and regional response. And secondly, support um, as, as new models of care are being uh, initiated um, to look at uh, how do we support them being set up um, in the, the way that they've got uh, fundamental standards uh, built in right at the beginning of that they've got the thinking about uh, governance and safety built in right at the beginning and to support our local uh, and regional and national partners to be able to um, to give them advice on that and, and help them think through those different issues. In terms of inadequate uh, providers. Um, in my sector, certainly we are following up those inadequate providers and identifying um, how we follow up those inadequate providers. There's some inadequate providers where the risk is so great, um, or we are that very concerned, or we've had an increase in concerns from whistleblowers or safeguarding concerns raised with us that we will go back in and look at those providers again. In some of the inadequate providers, we will be looking at um, actually how do we can we get assurance uh, from a desktop way or is there a focused in, a kind of a approach we can look at with those providers that will give us the assurance that they've dealt with the issues that we've identified and I think this is where our partnership working with our other agencies is so important so I, I was discussing a, a provider where we would have normally taken urgent cancellation uh, of uh, enforcement action yesterday and actually instead we came uh, to a view with the the local CCG and NHS England about a different approach that a we felt uh, passed the public interest test of making sure that people weren't without services during this very difficult time but also looked at managing that risk so the risk was mitigated and the public could be more assured of getting a, a safe service so I think it, it is on a much more kind of individual basis working with our partners partner agencies can, can I come in about about hospitals there is that right Peter Yes, please. Um, so, so uh, as, as Ian said right at the start, we're not interested just in services for people who've got COVID-19. We're interested in people who have other conditions who, who also need care. And, and, and we mustn't lose oversight of that and focus just on, on the particular 
uh, pressure of the COVID-19 service. And of course, we do have a lot of knowledge of services already in terms of we have inspected them and rated them. So we, we if you like, know the starting risk situation. And, you know, one of the good things about this is that, that a lot of services have improved considerably over the last few years. And I think that that puts them in a good position to deal with the enormous pressures they'll face. But you're right, Robert, there are some services still in special measures. There are some services we're still concerned about. And we'll need to monitor those services very carefully. And we'll be using predominantly data to monitor those services. But we are very keen to hear of the experience of staff and of patients and service users so we have a real sense about what is going on in those services and we will if necessary go in and, and inspect them but uh, this is something we're reluctant to do with the system under so much pressure but you know we will not uh, not stand we will not stand back if we believe we need to find out about real risks going on to, to, to people in services we do work very closely with the rest of the system particularly nhs england stroke improvement uh, uh, to make sure that services are getting the support of course that is going to have to continue and we're going to ask them to focus very much on those services we have the most concern about and a very similar picture in social care. Um, as with many things about COVID-19, I think it's bringing into sharp focus a lot of work that was in train anyway. So conversations we've been having for a couple of years about systems and about not just being responsible for running your hospital, your GP practice, your care home well. More importantly than ever is if you happen to have a care home that's not providing acceptable quality of care on your patch, it's not good enough to say that that's not my problem. We need, we need those beds to be available and we need people to be getting good quality care so I think we will see a, a kind of ramping up um, I'm hopeful we will see a ramping up of people working with their in the system to make sure there's the maximum capacity available and that it's of an acceptable enough standard as we kind of move through this this unprecedented time good um, thank you Paul, Mark. Uh, Robert go on just, just in sorry uh, in response to that what everyone has said that now I, I'm encouraged I am and I think it illustrates uh, how actually the importance of the Care Quality Commission is probably enhanced at a time of crisis like this, rather than something that is um, other, that other people might suggest gets in, in the way. And I think our flexibility in terms of focusing on the real issues in real time actually sets us apart from any other organisations. We have a facility and a resource to be able to tell the country, tell the government what is actually going on. Uh, without the filter of the layers that that exist in the system. And I, I, I think we must hold on to that uh, throughout what's going to be a very difficult time for everybody. But thank you for what you're doing. Thanks, Robert. Uh, by process of elimination, it was either Mark or Jora who wanted to come in earlier. Uh, Mark, was it you? It was, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to echo um, uh, my thanks uh, that's been already uh, referenced to by my other colleagues uh, to everything that the ET are doing and also um, all our employees. Um, but uh, Kirsty, just uh, it was really good to hear you talking about um, some of our focus on our people. I just wondered going forward just to for understanding, could we get an idea of the numbers of our people that are being redeployed back into um, frontline service? Allied to that, I wonder whether uh, there is a, pro well, I hope there is a process whereby those people who are redeployed, their managers are able to stay in touch with them, both from a communication from our point of view, but also to check on their well-being with us as their, their main employer. And then finally, will we be able to get a report um, on how many of our staff are self-isolating rather than um, registering as sick, uh, having the symptoms, having to self-isolate those members of the family of symptoms. So I wonder if you could just comment on that, please. Yes. Yeah. So, so one of the, 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 the bit I missed off, actually, was the fact that we've created a dashboard with all this information in. So the dashboard covers um, all our staff metrics. So people who are sick, people who are self-isolating, people who are out on secondment. So uh, I'm sure we'd be able to share that dashboard with you if you wanted to see it. So it's via Power BI. Uh, if people are out on sick, uh, out on common, we, we do what we normally do and ask people just to keep in touch uh, on a regular basis just to make sure they're all okay. Um, I forgot what your other question was. 
No, you've covered them. I've How covered them all. Yes. Yeah. I think that you've covered them because they're on the dashboard. And yes, that they're would on the be dashboard, good yeah. to see, but I'll need some Power BI training or you'll be able to send me a copy, hopefully. Can I just yeah. add, just in terms of releasing people back to the clinical front line, uh, just so people are aware, we have written as well to all of our specialist advisors saying that, uh, you know, clinical work is a priority at the moment. Yeah. It's also worth adding into that as well, Peter, that um, despite what people might think, we have a relatively small number of clinicians on uh, as, as employees. There's a, there's a kind of an assumption, I think, in some courses that all of our people are doctors or nurses, and, and clearly that's not the case. So, uh, so where we can, we're encouraging all of our colleagues to to volunteer, but actually the numbers of doctors and nurses is relatively modest. Yes, yeah. the number of, number of special advisors are higher, but the number of people who, who are employed as a CQC staff is relatively relatively low. But, but there are some uh, non-clinicians that we have uh, seconded as well to uh, places like uh, uh, PHE, aren't there? So, yes. it's, um, yeah, we're, we're making everybody available if there is something useful that they can go and do in the in the crisis. Ian, and is there also, anything? We're also collecting data so that we can we can offer volunteer we can offer a facility for people to volunteer outside the conventional health health and care scenario as well. So, people in schools and so forth. Great. Ian, is there anything you want to add um, before we move on from COVID-19 response? I, I think just just a, an enormous thank you to, um, to 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 my to my team who've who have have been working incredibly hard uh, to get us to where we've got to. I think it's felt like we've been sprinting up to this point to try and get to a position where we. Uh, understand what our role is uh, in in the uh, in the in the overall national response, um, uh, and I think that's an important it's an important place for us to be confident around. Um, I, I think there's still an awful lot of moving parts here, uh, and I'm sure uh, there'll be some rough edges to to our response. But we're trying incredibly hard to to make sure that we can be a responsible regulator rather than an inspector, but a responsible regulator that that is is protecting the public, is providing that independent public voice that a number of board members have spoken to, um, that also acts as an intermediary, uh, bringing together uh, groups of providers, particularly those providers that people like Rosie was talking about independent doctors, Kate was talking about social care, those providers that haven't necessarily got a traditional NHS voice, uh, making sure that that voice is heard. But I think we also can intermediate back as well, which is, um, you know, we are in extraordinary times um, and we need to to make sure that that whilst our focus has got to be on safety, it can't be safety using a benchmark of, of where we were two or three months ago. It's got to be safety in, 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 in a proportional and sensible way. And having an independent voice talking about that, uh, I think will be very powerful. Thanks, Peter. No, thank you. Sorry, Liz. I heard a, I heard a, a sort of squeak, which is probably, no, the, <laughs> um, pro probably the way you catch my eye uh, in this, uh, <laughs> this particular setting. So, Liz, did you want to ask something? I'm sorry yeah. I didn't to cut you off. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I think it's been good to hear the focus in this discussion on social care as well as health care and also on people of working age as well as older people. Um, I, I just um, wondered, given the extensive contact we have through experts by experience through the, the the links we have through all our engagement activity and given that there are there are people um out there who we know are feeling concerned for example if they employ personal assistants who might become ill with personal budgets in social care or who are reliant on domiciliary care or who are newly discharged from hospital uh, you know rightly because the hospital beds are needed or whatever um are we planning to use our channels to communicate to the public as well as listening from them uh, to, to offer some sort of clarity about what can be expected because clearly people are, everything is not going to remain exactly the same for people but uh, the, you know there's information coming from government and other sources and I just wondered if we can be part of that uh, communication that may help to give the public some level of reassurance in difficult times. Um, please forgive me, I, I need to join another call. Can I hand over to you, Chris, to just talk about yeah, what we're doing yeah, up front? Yeah, Thank you. So um, you're absolutely right. And we are having uh, daily conversations with NHS England and other partners about the information that we share back with the public. I think there's really the two important points here. We have a, a role in 
informing the system about what's happening at a, at a local level so that they understand the issues that are in a local area. And that should inform the action they take locally, but also the advice we offer nationally through PHE, NHS England and ourselves. So we absolutely will do that and we'll continue to provide that information back. I think I mentioned in my, my part, there's been a, a significant uptick in give feedback on care. Now that new platform is in place. I think people, many more people are, are giving us their feedback alongside the information we get from um, from uh, experts by experience and uh, other, other public groups. So we'll absolutely use that feedback to inform what's happening locally uh, and, and use that with the regional groups and also make sure that it can tie into the messages that we need to give back nationally. I think as Ian said at the very start, this is a, a daily ongoing uh, changing situation and we need to make sure we can respond uh, collectively and appropriately. Good, thank you. Um... I'll, I'll be happy to move on from COVID-19, at least briefly. So I, I see that uh, we've been joined by, by Stuart, Stuart Dean, and I wonder whether rather than uh, keep Stuart hanging on, uh, colleagues are happy to go to the market oversight report and then come back in and, and, and do the rest of the uh, uh, executive team update. Is that, is that OK? That, sound, that sounds fine. Uh, Stuart, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the purpose of this uh, sort of paper is to update on um, sort of what we've uh, been doing from a market oversight uh, perspective over the uh, past uh, six or so months, appreciating that we provided a similar update, I believe, in uh, June last year. So I'll uh, sort of canter through the presentation. I'll update specifically on COVID-19 at the end, and I'd sort of propose to take questions um, sort of thereafter, just given the forum that we're operating in uh, today. So um, slide three essentially uh, sort of aims to set out a sort of overview of market oversight's um, sort of responsibilities. So. What we're essentially saying is that in the broadest um, sense, the purpose of market oversight is to minimise avoidable uncertainty for vulnerable people owing to a disruption of the continuity of care as a result of business failure. We do that by monitoring the finances of potentially difficult to replace um, providers. And in the event that we satisfy ourselves of likely service cessation as a result of likely business failure, we would then issue a stage six notification to local authorities to assist them in their contingency planning arrangements. The scheme design assumes that the market can typically absorb business failure, hence um, a business failure in itself is insufficient to trigger the local authority notification. And it's also important to appreciate that market oversight doesn't actually have any powers to prevent provider failure. Um, more information in terms of the providers captured by the scheme, as well as our guidance, is published on CQC's uh, website. So just um, sort of bringing people up to speed in terms of the current picture, we've now got um, approximately 65 corporate providers including in the, included in the scheme and we've got a further visibility on the additional five uh, providers that will be coming in over the uh, next couple of months. Um, the additional uh, providers and the increase in providers more generally is being driven by two factors. Firstly, a broader market consolidation where the larger groups are divesting of problem locations or contracts. And those are frequently being picked up by providers that are just outside of the market, over, market oversight entry criteria. There's therefore a tendency for the new entrants coming into the scheme to enter at a higher level of risk, given that um, frequently they're coming into the scheme as a result of um, picking up um, other providers' uh, challenges. The second uh, sort of aspect that's driving the increase in names is the ongoing Four Seasons restructure, particularly the um, uh, restructure of the leasehold estate, which again has brought additional uh, operators into the scheme. So at this point in time, 
Um, if we consider care homes, we believe that we cover approximately 30% of the registered bed capacity that um, is registered with CQC. And whilst the data is imperfect, we believe that we have a similar coverage of home care uh, providers. If I turn to the risk profile across the Marcus Oversight Scheme, when the highest categories of risk are considered before CQC is legally required to make the local authority notification that I've referred to previously, there's been a 20 percentage point deterioration in risk since the scheme was set up in April 2005. Whilst that's a seven percentage point reduction in the level of um, sort of risk deterioration on the same basis from the same inception date, what it actually masks is that there's a significant increase in risk in our highest risk classification prior to us um, needing to issue a local authority uh, notification. And this analysis has been prepared prior to the impact of COVID-19, which I'll talk to um, latterly. In terms of local authority notification position, that remains unchanged. We've issued uh, two, one being um, with regards to a single asset and a single local authority. The second being a corporate wide notification um, with regards to allied healthcare. The operation of market oversight has a number of um, what I've sort of referred to here on slide four as unseen influences, those being um, improved financial discipline across the um, providers captured by the scheme and the byproduct of that being enhanced financial stability. We've also um, can talk to a number of uh, sort of specific instances whereby by effectively holding um, providers and the broader stakeholders um, to account, we've been able to um, preserve uh, and indeed secure additional cash injections to maintain future liquidity. Slides five and six talk to the consolidated data uh, trending and that is um, following analysis that's based on a consistent population of names captured by the market oversight scheme and it relates predominantly to the two year period ended the 30th of September 2019. So again this predates any impact of um, sort of the ongoing challenge in the system. So if we just focus on this analysis, then over the two year period, overall turnover has increased by approximately 8%. And the component parts of that increase are a 42% increase in turnover across non-specialist care home providers that have a higher proportion of private pay. So a non-specialist care home provider would be essentially a residential or a nursing care uh, service and when we're talking to a higher proportion of private pay it would be where um, the provider is advising us through the quarterly template that more than 40 percent of turnover is attributed to um, private pay. The second limb of that increase that eight percent increase in overall turnover is as a result of an 11 percent increase in turnover within uh, specialist providers and our definition of specialist providers captures both specialist care home providers as well as specialist home care providers so essentially supported living services. Whilst um, those two areas have been uh, increasing from a turnover point of view, um, what we have seen is a 20% reduction in the uh, turnover attributed to non-specialist care home providers that are predominantly publicly funded. So what we've got is a reduction in turnover attributed to public services and an increase in turnover <clears throat> excuse me, attributed to private pay provision. That's important because notwithstanding um, sort of that, that change in the sales mix within turnover, 
we're still seeing an overall attrition to profit margins. And on uh, at the bottom of slide five, we talked to EBITDARM margins, which are a very high level uh, proxy for profit. And we're seeing over the two year period, a further half a percentage point deterioration in that profit margin to 22.4%. And that is being driven essentially by staff costs and agency costs outpacing any increase in turnover. If we turn the page onto slide six, um, we look at occupancy, which overall has remained broadly stable at 87%, albeit the component parts when split between predominantly publicly funded uh, provision and predominantly private funded uh, provision demonstrate that there has been a 22% reduction in available bed capacity in publicly funded provision and a 30% increase in capacity in privately funded biased uh, provision. And then if we look at the overall picture as to what's happening within uh, CQC registered beds, we've seen a 3,427 uh, bed reduction over the two year period, which when you consider the practic, it is a percentage of the practical spare capacity in the system that equates to broadly a 10% reduction in bed capacity over that two year period. We've then done some analysis uh, in terms of the outlook for the sector and essentially what this is um, suggesting is that on average a local author authority fee increase of circa three to four percent would be required to maintain current EBITDA uh, margins. But as you'll appreciate from my prior comments, that level of profitability is already insufficient to support the attributes of a normally performing market. And I say that because of, despite the accepted increase in demand, bed capacity continues to reduce. The limited inward investment that is occurring is biased towards private pay provision, where the profit margins are typically higher and in line with other comparable markets. And latterly, over 80% of the registered beds are over 40 years old, which is important because given that the individuals who are typically in these services have an increasing acuity, there are practical considerations around just steps, layout, bedroom sizes, corridor widths that actually prohibit that type of um, individual from being uh, appropriately looked after. So if we then turn our thoughts to um, COVID-19, then um, the adult social care sector um, is, has significant vulnerability. I say that because um, it's driven by the typical person using these services being more susceptible to the virus, virus and as such occupancy um, will decline. There's limited cost base flexibility generally across the sector and a potential doubling up of costs to cover sickness and self-isolation alongside um, methods of payment where typically the providers would be paid for care delivered rather than um, the cost of uh, maintaining a level of care. And thirdly, um, there's the well reported workforce workforce challenges given the general level of vacancies in the sector. The fact that the ASC workforce is frequently older and therefore more susceptible and the proportion of the workforce that are low income and therefore particularly susceptible to school closures and increased childcare costs. And the final point would be uh, sort of the one that I've made around the low margins and those um, sort of being uh, struggling to support the attributes of a normally functioning market. So as a result of that, market oversight has undertaken a one off review of its portfolio to specifically consider those providers um, that may be more exposed to a COVID-19 shock. 
The outcome of that review has identified circa 15% of the portfolio where uh, we're concerned that there's an immediate um, challenge with regards to financial uh, viability. And as such, the teams are engaging with those providers to understand their, both their operational as well as their financial contingencies. So just to be clear, um, sort of in the in the absence of appropriate sector support, this will be a sector wide issue with knock on implications for the NHS, and therefore market oversight continues to uh, engage across government to influence and inform thinking. Can I take any questions? Stuart, thank you very much. I, I think what your presentation has demonstrated is the phenomenally deep knowledge that, that you and your colleagues have of the financial well-being or otherwise of, of the sector. It is, of course, worth remembering it is only that part of the sector that's in the market oversight scheme, so it's not uh, not everybody. But I, I think it, 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 we are occasionally accused of not having that that detailed knowledge i think you've demonstrated very clearly that, that that you do have that knowledge which is which is really good so colleagues any any questions for stuart blow our minds away sorry go on ian it, it's in i just i mean i think I, stuart made the point but i think it's just worth restating that um the the amount of hard levers that stuart and his team have got to um, to effect change are, are pretty much zero, uh, but what we what they can do is do the behind the scenes work that he was alluding to, and I think he's he and the team do a, a great job of of having those behind the scenes conversations um, to make sure that uh, that the right decisions are made by banks and others, um, and I, I think that that role will become increasingly important in in, mm. in the coming months as as the sector becomes uh, becomes under a lot of pressure, and I think trying to maintain visibility is going to be challenging undoubtedly but i, I think it, it's a really important piece of work that that the cqc we don't often talk about so this is a really important opportunity to publicly talk about the work that Stuart and his team do I agree. Peter, may I, I think, yes please john um thank you very much uh, this is a really incisive piece of analysis and um uh if if these aren't red flags i don't know what is uh in particular, your reference to um, the ability of the system to respond to the COVID-19 uh, echoes something I said a few minutes ago. Chris, there's some really meaty figures here. Uh, have we any plans for using that, um, either publicly or within governmental discussions, to get people to really sit up and take notice? As Stuart said, I think um, he and his team are well engaged with um, with colleagues across government, and it is a it is a very important part of how we talk about the state of care, both nationally and regionally, and will uh, continue to be so. I think it will be interesting to see how the situation develops as we go through the next few months and COVID, and I think it should form part of our conversation back both regionally and nationally that I mentioned about how we take the right action to make sure services are supported. I think, um, just to echo Peter's points, I think it is important that we recognise that we do have this insight and understanding and that that information is shared with colleagues across the sector, and that's something I'll be keen to do. John, it may also be worth adding that that Kate, who's gone off to do, uh, I've just, something. I've just popped oh, back. She's back. Sorry, she's back. Hello. Right. Well, you may want to comment then, Kate. I was going to say that you you you're very close to Stuart on and, and the market oversight, and you're also very close to the department and others. So you probably are the conduit for that information, but. Maybe you're going to say and, and forgive me, because I, I missed the first part. I, I don't know what, what's already um, been described. I suppose I just want to emphasise this 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 work, this oversight is more important than ever. So um, there are conversations going on by trade associations about the potential impact that they will see and are, some are already seeing about COVID-19 and the workforce and the impact on their finances. So it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that we continue to use that intelligence to do the behind the scenes conversations with um, those 
those large providers, um, but also to kind of really shine a spotlight on on the risk and how that risk will um, change in, in coming weeks and months as providers respond to um, to, to these uh, completely unprecedented times that, that we're all entering into together. And I think John's question was was about then sharing that 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 detail yes. intelligence with with the department and yeah. other other relevant bodies. Yeah, so obviously Stuart has, has those relationships. I am also talking uh, regularly, not only with the department, but things people such as ADAS and the Local Government Association, um, along with trades as well. So wherever possible, we are endeavouring to speak with one voice with a kind of single view of the truth about what we think the impact is likely to be, what we think the gap is, and, and what the solutions may, uh, may be in terms of trying to bring a bit of stability to a sector that hasn't had any, uh, any assurance around that, what that long-term financial plan uh, will be for for social care. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any, any other comments or questions? Um, just a question, Peter, if, I'm, if I may. Um, yes, Robert. Well, firstly, uh, th these are very compelling figures and they need wide circulation, in my view. Um, thank you for them, Stuart. Um, but my question is whether the uh, proposals announced by the Chancellor in relation to business support and so on have any at least short-term favourable impact on this sector in, in the same way as on other sectors. And I appreciate that's maybe difficult to judge in the absence of detail, um, but presumably that care, care home organisations are able to benefit from this form of support as much as anybody else or not. I don't know. Thanks, Robert. Um, so uh, my understanding is, um, yes, they will be sort of available to um, sort of this sector uh, on a similar basis to other sectors. But at this point in time, there hasn't been any sort of specific sector support announcement, as we've seen with um, sort of the airline industry, uh, for instance. I think the key thing to that I would emphasise to echo uh, Peter's point is that the challenge that the sector is going to be seen is likely to be as much a uh, challenge for the smaller providers as it will be for the larger providers. And it very much depends on what their sort of liquidity uh, position is. Um, so that's uh, sort of what we've um, focused on. I think it's also important to for the uh, sort of providers to be getting the sort of granularity so that the workforce understands that of the various support packages that have been mentioned, what that actually means. So will the sort of workers benefit from um, sort of additional benefit payments or will support go into providers by way of additional funding uh, grants, etc. And once that sort of uh, granularity is um, provided, then between the providers and the workforce, they can work out how it's going to um, land. Key point that I cannot emphasise um, sort of enough is that the money needs to keep flowing in the system um, because just by nature of the high percentage of turnover that's paid out every month and for some providers more frequently than monthly on staff costs and agency payments, if there is a bump in the road from um, sort of the non-payment or a delay in the payment of uh, sort of standard invoices, then it's likely to have a disproportionate impact on this sector. And that's a disproportionate negative impact on this sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stuart, thank you very much for what you and the team are doing. Um, as uh, uh, Ian said, that this has nev never been more important. It's always been important, but it's never been more important than it is at the moment. So thanks for the work you're doing. I think the, the sort of key messages back from the board are, are just to uh, share this, this as widely as we can so that government, that's uh, the department, but it's obviously also the, the Treasury as they're thinking through uh, the responses to the crisis have this information which um, they might not otherwise have or, or fully appreciate. So thanks again for what you do. Right, okay. guys. Uh, I am conscious that we started this meeting, um, the, the, the full board meeting started uh, four hours and five minutes ago. Um, time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Uh, 
I'm minded if you can bear with it to try and finish this part of the 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 meeting, uh, which I think will take about another half hour, and then break for a quick sandwich. Um, is that is that okay? Um, I'm also conscious we've got quite a long afternoon ahead of us as well. Right, so let's uh, come back in, if we could, please, to the the other parts of the executive team uh, report. Uh, uh, we've done the COVID response, but we haven't done the rest. Perhaps we can canter through that. Okay, thank, thanks, Peter. Again, mindful of time. If I hand over to Kate to talk about uh, on page 83 of 102, uh, if you're following on diligence, to talk okay. about social safety report. Thanks, Kate. So very briefly, um, on the 27th of Feb, we published our report um, promoting sexual em empowerment um, that uh, looked at our findings following a review of three months worth of notifications in which the provider checked the box to say that um, a sexually inappropriate incident had happened. Anything that uh, ranged from inappropriate sexual touching to um, someone, uh, in, you know, nudity through to sexual assault. Um, so the report has a couple of uh, kind of key messages in it. One, it talks about how pretty broadly we are not as good as we need to be as a society in having conversations about sex, sexuality and relationships. And because we are not that confident in talking about it in general, why on earth would we expect uh, social care workers to feel like they have the skills and the um, permissions to have um, type, those types of conversations with people? So there's a real issue about when people are identified as having social care needs. As a general rule, we, uh, we don't give sufficient attention to what their needs are around sex, sexuality and relationships. So uh, the report landed um, after a huge amount of effort. It, it was um, unanimous, unanimously well received by um, charities and um, all of our provider um, organisations, uh, which are really pleased about. Um, but obviously, there's no point in having a report unless it leads to meaningful change. So we had um, a number of really courageous families who told their stories about when things go wrong with a plea to, we are doing this so that this doesn't happen for anyone else. So there are recommendations in there around around um, enhanced training for the social care workforce around um, sex, sex, sexuality and relationships. And we're delighted that the department has found some funding for this and skills for care will be um, uh, making that happen in the next couple of months. But also we will increase our focus on this when we go out and regulate. So we'll increase our focus on how open is the culture to having conversations about sex and sexuality. But also when we look at individual care plans, uh, are those needs recognised and are people um, supported to have the fulfilling lives that the rest of us have um, outside of um, social care settings. Good, thanks, Kate. Ian? Uh, thanks. If we move on to um, Mr. Ted. Uh, well, we've already uh, covered the closed environment, so I won't cover that section of the report again. I think, I think all those issues are covered. And just highlighting that we published uh, uh, on March the 5th a report on quality improvement in four trusts and how they sustained it over time. Uh, and I think uh, this is an important part of our contribution to uh, the uh, uh, driving improvement in trusts. And uh, it's been well received and I think will be an important report going forward. Thanks, Ted. Um, if and then moving on to the assessment framework consultation. As board members will know, we've been working with NHS E and I on our assessment framework. I think we've agreed with them in the light of COVID-19 to delay the consultation that was uh, that was scheduled, and we will uh, we'll, we'll update the board when that uh, when we get back to that work again. Uh, a couple of forthcoming publications: one from the second round of. Uh, sandboxing and and one from uh, and run around innovation. I think again uh, the sandboxing uh, report I think is 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 interesting in terms of demonstrating how we can work with providers collaboratively to ensure that new services can be registered. And I think that that may have some some um, some applicability during the COVID nineteen emergency. I think in terms of of principles for successful innovation. Um, I think whilst we're, we're intending to publish the report, uh, really we need to come back to this at a later date uh, to provide further support for provided as, as necessary. Um, and then finally, um, Peter, if there's no other questions, we, we agreed that we would do a people plan update at each board meeting and that's shown on page six of the report. Uh, and Kirsty can add to that if there's any, any questions. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Ian. Um, colleagues, any, any questions for the exec team? 
Good. I, I, I thought it was a, uh, yeah, the, the, the reports were, were good and, and clear. So um, if nobody wants to ask Chairman, anything. Chairman, Chairman sorry, sorry yep. I, I was muted. I was trying to say yes, but I was muted. Could, it, could I just ask a question to Ted, please? Um, it's a very good um, report, Ted, in, in, in the exec report, but your point about developing the support for our inspectors to gather the views and experiences of people who are non-verbal. I mean, that came out very strongly in uh, Professor Murphy's report. And I just wonder whether, are you thinking of making Makaton a core competence part of training for inspectors for these, for these environments? And also attached to that, are you also putting some more training in around observation, because she mentioned about communication and observation? Well, uh, Mark, it, 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 we are obviously following up on the uh, uh, recommendations of Professor Murphy's report, and one of the key elements of that is how we can better communicate with service users. So I think we'll be exploring all those issues that you've developed. I don't think we've got a full, we, we haven't got a determined plan yet, so I think work is being done and is under review on those areas. And I think that that, that is a very strong message coming out of uh, Professor Murphy's report, and I think it's something we've got to focus on. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, last major item uh, is uh, Liz, the uh, uh, oral update on the uh, RGC meeting we had last night or yesterday afternoon. Liz? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. We started, as uh, you might expect, by having a discussion about uh, implications of COVID-19 uh, in the context of the, the, those risks, regulatory risks, that the Regulatory government, Governance Committee looked at. And we agreed that at our next meeting, we would look particularly at the regulatory methodology that's being developed for, for use during this uh, unusual period. Uh, so we will be coming back to that. Obviously, it'll be discussed at the main board as well, but we, we will be doing a sort of deep dive on it next time. Um, we had two major items for discussion yesterday. The first was about uh, medicine optimization and a uh, big focus on how to reduce medication errors. So the World Health Organization uh, has uh, set everybody a target of reducing medication errors by 50% by 2023. Uh, and we had a very interesting presentation about everything CQC is doing in this space. Quite a lot of upstream work to, uh, to, to encourage and stimulate improvement through collaboration with a whole range of other agencies. And also um, the, the uh, team in CQC who have expertise working closely, offering training, et cetera, to our inspectors so that we can really pick up on those medication errors. We also discussed the social care sector where there isn't a, an independent reporting mechanism as there is in healthcare for medication errors. And we explored whether there might be a role for us with others to you know, discuss how that might be rectified. Um, we then discussed enforcement uh, and we looked at the trends in our own enforcement activity, the significant use of our enforcement powers, uh, including one uh, absolutely record fine of half a million pounds. Um, uh, we noted that there'd been an increase in um, appeals to us about uh, decisions um, being allowed with conditions. And we had a bit of, so, so in other words, um, the, the uh, service might be able to continue or the particular part of the service be able to continue, but with clear conditions that we monitor. And we had a bit of debate about whether we could do that kind of improvement encouragement a bit earlier before you get to a tribunal. Um, we were interested to hear about uh, future plans um, on enforcement, particularly around uh, making more use of tho those colleagues who have particular investigation skills to just to strengthen the overall approach and integrate it. Uh, and we had a bit of discussion about sort of um, where we focus our enforcement energies. And um, we thought that there may be certain areas where we could um, particularly gather information to enable us to take enforcement activity where appropriate. For example, we, we, we discussed um, the closed environments. Um, 
but clearly we are enforcing across the piece. Great, Liz. Well. Okay, thank you. That's that that that's um, uh, it was a really really good uh, series of discussions yesterday. So thank you for that. Um, is there any other business that anybody on the board wants to raise? Okay. So um, I think just to note that uh, our next board meeting in April is scheduled to be in Leeds, but given the um, the, the, the COVID-19 situation, we will not be having the board meeting in Leeds. In all probability, it'll be another virtual meeting, but um, in the unlikely event we can have a, a, a physical meeting again, it, it will be in London. So just to note that. Um, uh, I should have said at the end of uh, uh, thanking uh, Professor Murphy that her report, Chris, is being published um, uh, immediately after this this meeting, I think. It's, so gone, that, it's gone at one o'clock, so it's, it's out there uh, in the public domain now. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, and then uh, lastly, I, I was just again wanting to uh, thank Mark Sutton and the team. Um, from my point of view, this has worked incredibly well as a meeting format. What it's like for anybody sitting outside viewing it, I have no idea. Uh, the only uh, additional ask I have, Mark, is whether the chair can have a, a button that mutes colleagues. We could get through this meeting much quicker if I could mute everybody. There <laughs> is one, Peter. There is one. Ah. Mutual. Ah, you'll have to tell me how to do that. Fantastic. <laughs> right. Seriously, um, uh, just before we, we completely finish, um, because obviously the public are not able to join us in the normal way, I have exceptionally said that we will take some questions from the public. Uh, and uh, there are two questions from David Hogarth and one from Robin Pike. And I'm going to slightly truncate the, 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 the question, uh, but just to, David uh, Hogarth's first question uh, is around uh, telephone outpatient appointments and his rather varied experience uh, of those happening. And, and I think this is probably for you, Ted. David wants to know uh, whether our, our normal process looks at uh, telephone appointments and if not should it uh, well I, I, I think in answer, in answer to his question uh, yes it would be included in our inspection of outpatients I'm not sure it gets as much focus as it could get uh, and I think there's real opportunity here particularly in, under current circumstances the use of telephone and virtual appointments is becoming much more common and frequent and I think we need to develop an approach to uh, assessing those services in perhaps more detail. I, we've seen, I, I think, such as telephone appointments as relatively peripheral to the main work of outpatients. And so while we would have included it, it would not have had a strong focus. And I think going forward, there really is an opportunity to look at virtual appointments in much more detail. Great, thank you. Uh, David's second question um, and I will read out the, 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 the relevant sentence. Uh, for 18 months, I've been urging CQC to get a page about uh, sing, simple video communications into the technology resource. And in November, uh, Peter, that's me, told me there would be a general piece about it and thought it would be ready by Janu January. Uh, why hasn't this happened? Uh, so, is that Kate? Yeah, yeah, two things on that. So one, we have published our um, driving improvement through technology, which um, shines a spotlight on best practice when it comes to tech across health and social care. So uh, we've got that. The second thing kind of related back to our earlier um, focus topic, we are, we've are we got a specific work stream looking at surveillance and how surveillance should be used by us as a regulator under the closed environment banner. So so two things. One, we have been talking about it through our, um, our independent voice work. And two, uh, we've had a position on um, surveillance, surveillance to date that we are actively reviewing in light of Professor Murphy's comments about how we really get under the skin of closed environments and what role it might have in helping us do that or not. Uh, and I think, Kate, that uh, coming back to COVID-19, when uh, a lot of people are likely to be more isolated than they've ever been, uh, the use of uh, te technology to keep in yeah. touch with friends and family is going to be really, really important. And whether it's for us or other people, certainly to the extent we can promote that thought would yes. I, I think be very appropriate, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Great. And then uh, the last the last question is from Robin Pike. Um, and uh, Rosie, I think it's for you. Uh, how do inspectors review access to secondary care from GP surgeries? So um, we look at this uh, through our assessment framework for all five key questions, actually. And when we're on a section, we look at records that are kept and referrals that are made and uh, track that through. Um, I think this is something that as we develop our integrated care work, I'm keen that we expand further and start to track patients through the whole system and start to think about how do we how do we look at um, a person's journey as they're being referred from a from a GP right the way through to seeing uh, the specialist they need um, and then back through in that process as well as they come uh, out of care of, of a consultant and or a, a specialist and the the actions that are taken after that. So I think we already do a lot with our current assessment framework, but I think there's a lot more we can expand as we go through our work on integrated care. Great. So thank you all very much indeed. That's the end of the public board meeting. Um, if colleagues are uh, happy to have a 25 minute break rather than a 45 minute break, we could start again uh, on the scheduled time at uh, quarter two Two is that is that acceptable to everybody? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon.